Hey there, little poets. Hope you're having a great day. We're getting started with uh, some vocabulary as we go in today's lesson. Not our vocabulary words, but uh, some words that we could make if we use the prefixes un or in. Remember, prefixes come at the beginning. Pre means before. So these are both at the beginning of a word. A prefix is a word part added to the beginning of a base word that changes the meaning of the word. The prefix un means not or to remove. And the prefix in means not, without, or into. So both of these prefix change the meaning of the word. They make them not something pretty much. So look at these ones for un. There's undaunted, undaunted uneven even you know what something's even if it's uneven it's not even unhook you might hook something if it's unhooked it's not hooked anymore kind with a prefix un would be unkind i'd rather hang out with somebody who's kind than somebody who's unkind not kind wouldn't you in kind of does the same thing look at this word what a big word incomprehensibility <laughs> Comprehend means to understand. Comprehensible means you can understand it. Comprehensibility means uh, you're, that you're able to understand the, the act of being able to understand it. So incomprehensibility means you're not able to easily understand something, something that's not able to be easily understood, like how to spell this word, right? That's a big word right there, incomprehensibility incapable if you're capable of doing something you can do it but if you're incapable you can't do it visible it means i can see you but if you're invisible it means i can't see you ability means you can you have the ability to do something but if you have an inability you can't do it so these prefixes change the word to not or you can't un and in prefixes you can add to the beginning of base words to change their meaning hey let's look at a Another anchor chart today. And let's look at our figurative language one. We've looked at this one several times this year, but on this week of poetry is a great time to go back and look at this again. So remember, figurative language creates special effects or feelings or makes a point. It fig includes figures of speech that compare, exaggerate, or mean something different from what's expected. So a simile. Comparing two things using like or as. I think the poem in our story uh, has, uses the simile that, uh, what was it, calm water? Calm water or peaceful water, I forget what it was called, is like a mirror looking at the sky. So it was a simile. It was like something or it's as something. Metaphor means one thing is another. I think the metaphor in that poem on the on soup, uh, alphabet soup, it says the soup is a steamy lagoon. It's calling it something without using like or as. Personification. The soup story also had some personification, giving human qualities or characteristics to an object. Uh, the capital letters were doing the backstroke, <laughs> I think, in the soup. Letters can't really swim, can they? But only people can. Oh, and fish. <laughs> Alliteration. Repeating that beginning sound. Susan sent, Sally sent Susan some samples of soup. Repeating that S sound at the beginning a bunch. That's alliteration. Assonance, you don't see it quite as often, but that middle vowel sound sounds the same in the words. Cat ran past the man. Ah, ah, ah. You're right there. And then sensory language, words that appeal to the five senses. Think about visualizing like we talked about on Monday. My poem today, I tried to write a poem for today that uses sensory language and makes you visualize something. I wrote a poem about my favorite food ribs. And so it's short, but I tried to use some sensory words to make you smell, taste, feel something, see something. So here's my little short poem about ribs. Sweet, smoky paradise. Tender, tasty enjoyment. Sizzling, saucy temptation. I'll take the ribs, please. <laughs> what do you think? So it's just a simple little short poem. I, I used some alliteration at the beginning. I used two adjectives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pulled our adjectives in to describe these nouns. So sweet and smoky, 
hear the alliteration there with the S sound, two adjectives to describe paradise, tender and tasty, starting with the same letter, enjoyment, sizzling, saucy, temptation. I'll take the ribs, please. So this has several of the things we've talked about. Number one, it's talked about adjectives in it. Uh, try to use visualization. Think of something being sweet, smoky, sizzling, and saucy. You can hear it. Maybe they hear the ribs sizzling as they come to your plate after they just got out of the off the grill. Oh, I'm making myself hungry. I had to qu quit talking about this poem. But you can write a poem that uses uh, those sensory words like we saw here. Sensory language, words that appeal to the senses. Well, we're going to look at our poems this week. Open up your book to 359 and uh, read along with me. We're going to look at our poems for this week, I should say. And we're going to read inside our uh, reading books, the poems one more time. So I want you to get your reading book and read them with me. The Art of Poetry. All right, this first one is an acrostic. It spells language going down. And this was all this was also a metaphor, wasn't it? Saying that libraries are gardens. Libraries are necessary gardens unsurpassed at growing excitement. As you think about your poem, if you would like to write one like this, I hope you so I hope somebody will. I'd love to read it. Eating alphabet soup. This may be the poem I remember the most. It's got a lot of different types of um, figurative language in it and imagery. Eating alphabet soup. My advice to this tablespoon slurper. Beware what you do with that scoop. The capitals, sir, can cause quite a stir in a bowl full of alphabet soup. While K, Z, and B do the backstroke, there's that personification, across this hot, steamy lagoon, there's a metaphor calling a bowl of soup a hot, steamy lagoon, some good adjectives, hot and steamy. The fun-loving vowels may want tiny towels to dry themselves off on the spoon. But when letters go swimming together, in sentences nothing can beat. The pleasure of reading, the food that you're eating, so dive in and bon appetit. I felt a lot of rhythm in this poem, too. If, if we read it, and kind of read it with rhythm. My advice to the tablespoon slurper, beware what you do with that scoop. The capital, sir, can cause quite a stir in a bowl full of alphabet soup. You feel the rhythm to this song? It's got a lot of rhythm in it. While KZ and B do the backstroke across this hot steamy lagoon, the fun-loving vowels may want tiny towels to dry themselves off on the spoon. But when letters go swimming together in sentences nothing can beat, the pleasure of reading the food that you're eating, so dive in and bon appetit. I like the rhythm in that poem, too. So your poem can have a lot of rhythm that you write. You can create a, a rhythm in your poem. There's a lot of noise in the hall today. I don't know what's going on out there. I don't know if you can hear it or not. You send some kind of machine to clean the hall. So um, so there's rhythm in it, these uh, metaphors and similes in the poem. Um, and then just the design of the poem changes uh, the, where the stanzas are separated. And then these are indented a bit, these third and fourth line of each poem. It's got some rhyming also. This poem includes a lot of elements of poetry. Let's go to the next one. The Big Word Girl. I like this one too. Of all the clever girls I know, Elaine's the one who counts. But what she counts are syllables in words I can't pronounce. I took her to a horror show, Godzilla meets Tooth Fairy, but she could not unglue her eyes from Webster's Dictionary. She put her trembling hand in mine, Godzilla smashed the floor, for she had come across a word she'd never seen before. Before, But when the lights came on, Elaine was sound asleep and snoring. I woke her up. She yawned and said, how uncustomarily, extraordinarily, incomprehensibly boring. Lots of prefixes and suffixes on this word, aren't there? These words. And another one I enjoy. I'll enjoy the shape of this poem. Balloon. I like what they did with the title, too. They made that L look like a balloon flying off. When it first slipped out of my hand, I was sad to see my balloon floating away. But as it rose higher in the sky, I imagined it, I imagined it landing in some faraway yard where a kid like me would find it 
I wonder how far the balloon had flown and who held it last. And that thought made me smile. You know, this is one big sentence. If you look at it, there's a comma every now and then that wants you to make you want to pause when you're reading. When it first slipped out of my hand, I was sad to see my balloon floating away. You kind of pause where there's a comma, don't you? Okay. And then the arrow in the song. I shot an arrow into the air. It fell to earth. I know not where. For so swiftly it flew, the sight could not follow it in its flight. I breathed the song into the air. It fell to earth, I knew not where. For who has sight so keen and strong that it can follow the flight of song? Long, long afterward, in an oak, I found an arrow still unbroke. And the song, from beginning to end, I found it again in the heart of a friend. There's our English and Spanish poems. Cruising this river on a rubber boat at full speed, bumping our way to the base of the thundering falls, to end up completely slapped and drenched by cool river water, beats by far any amusement park attraction. It's kind of like a shape in this poem, too, kind of like goes along with the waterfall, doesn't it? You see this? These got an illustration behind them, and they kind of goes with the waterfall, kind of curved there like a waterfall. Yeah, so... There's a lot of imagery in this in this poem. Um, cool river water makes you feel the cool river water to be slapped and drenched by the water. You feel that water hitting us and making us cool. Good adjectives. Uh, a rubber boat. Thundering falls. Good adjectives that describe makes them more interesting to read. Then in Spanish, mejor diversión. Recorrer este río en un gomón a todo velocidad. Acercarse a tumbos hasta quedar en la base del trueño de la cascada para acabar completamente. <laughs> I said that wrong, probably. Cachetados, cacheteados y empap empapados por el agua frío del río. Supera de veras en mucho cualquier atracción de un parque de diversión. There you go. And this last one here, quiet water, quiet water, water before it plunges down a waterfall is as still as a mirror facing the sky. There's that simile using as to compare the water to a mirror. Aqua quieta. El agua antes de caer en catarata. En tan quieta como espejo de cara el cielo. Okay. Well, there's our poems again. I hope you're getting close, if not already finished with your poem that you're going to turn into me tomorrow. You definitely today need to take some time and work on that poem and get some ideas down what you're going to write about. I've given you three examples. I've written about a cat. I've written about the Super Bowl. I've written about my favorite food. I'll give you another example tomorrow. So be thinking about what your poem's going to be about. Try to try to write some thoughts down. Like I said, I'm not going to give you a whole bunch of rules about how long it has to be, or I just want you to enjoy writing it and, and make it good. Um, so today you're going to do another spelling practice for me. You need to work on that poem and you have some more adjective practice for me. So do those things for me now. Thank you for being a good listener. We'll see you tomorrow.